Section 5, page 13. Part 3. It's invariably happened in the same way. Mrs. Julius Beaufort, on the night of her annual ball, never failed to appear at the opera. Indeed, she always gave her ball on an opera night in order to emphasize her complete superiority to household cares and her possession of a staff of servants competent to organize every detail of the entertainment in her absence. The Beaufort's house was one of the few in New York that possessed a ballroom. In parentheses, it antedated even Mrs. Manson's Mingotts and the Hadley Shiverses. And at that time, when it was beginning to the thought provincial to put a crash over the driving room floor and move the furniture upstairs, the possession of a ballroom that was used for no other purpose and left for 364 days of the year to shattered darkness with its gilt chairs stacked in a corner and its chandelier in a bag. This undoubted superiority was felt to compensate for whatever was regrettable in the Beaufort past. Miss Archer, who was fond of coining her social philosophy into axioms, had once said, We all have our pet common people. And though the phrase was a daring one, its truth was secretly admitted in many an exclusive bosom. But the Beforts weren't exactly common. Some people said that they were even worse. Miss Beaufort belonged indeed to one of America's most honored families. She had been the lovely Regina Dallas, in parentheses of the South Carolina branch. A penniless beauty introduced to New York society by her cousin, the imprudent Medora Manson, who was always doing the wrong thing from the right motive. When one was related to the Mansons and the Rushworths, one had a Duray de Cité, in parentheses, as Mrs. Sillerton Jackson, who had frequented the two years, called it. In New York society, but did one not forfeit in it in marrying Julius Beaufort? The question was, who was Beaufort? He passed for an Englishman, was agreeable handsome, ill-tempered, hospitable, and witty. He had come to America with letters of recommendation from old Mrs. Manson Mingott's English son-in-law, the banker, and had speedily made himself an important position in the world of affairs. But his habits were dissipated, his tongue was bitter, his antecedents were mysterious. And when Medora Manson announced her cousin's engagement to him, it was felt to be one more act of fully impure Medora's long record of imprudences. But folly is as often justified of her children as wisdom, and two years after young Mrs. Beaufort's marriage, it was admitted that she had the most distinguished house in New York. No one knew exactly how the miracle was accomplished. She was indolent, passive, the caustic even called her dull, but dressed like an idol, hung with pearls, growing younger and blonder, and more beautiful each year. She throned in Mr. Beaufort's heavy brownstone palace, and drove all the world there without lifting her jeweled little finger. The knowing people said it was Beaufort himself who trained the servants, taught the chef new dishes, told the gardeners what hothouse flowers to grow for the dinner table, and the drawing rooms, selected the guest, breathed the after-dinner punch, dictated the little notes his wife wrote to her friends. If he did, these domestic activities were privately performed and he presented to the world the appearance of a careless and hospitable millionaire strolling into his own driving room with the detachment of an invited guest, 
and saying, My wife's gluxnias are a marvel, aren't they? I believe she gets them out from Q. Mr. Beaufort's secret, people were agreed, was the way he carried things off. It was all very well to wish for that he had been helped to leave England by the international banking house in which he had been employed. He carried off that rumor as easily as the rest. True, New York's business conscience was no less sensitive than its moral standard. He carried everything before him, and all New York into his roving room. And for over twenty years now people had said they were going to the Beforts with the same tone of security, as if they had said they were going to the Mrs. Man Manson Mingotts. And with the added satisfaction of knowing they will get hot canvas back ducks and vintage wines, instead of tepid wild clico without a year and warmed up croquettes from Philadelphia. Mrs. Beaufort then had as usual appeared in her box just before the Jevil song, and when again as usual she rose at the end of the third act, drew her opera cloak about her lovely shoulders, and disappeared. New York knew that meant that half an hour later the ball would begin. The Beaufort house was one that New Yorkers were proud to show the foreigners, especially on the night of the annual ball. The Beaufords had been among the first people in New York to own their own red velvet carpet and have it rolled down the steps by their own footman. Under their own awning, instead of hiring it with the supper and ballroom chairs. They had also inaugurated the custom of letting the ladies take their clocks off in the hall, instead of shuffling up to the hostess bedroom and recording their hair with the aid of the gas burner. Beaufort was understood to have said that he supposed all his wife's friends had maids, mates who saw it that they were properly cafes when they left home. Then the house had been boldly planned with a ballroom, so that, instead of squeezing through a narrow passage to get it to it, in parentheses, as at the Shiverses, one marched solemnly down a vista of enfiladed drawing rooms, in parentheses, the sea green, the crimson, and the button d'or seeing from afar the many candled lustres reflected in the polished parquetry, and beyond that the depths of a conversatory, where camellias and tree ferns arched their costly foliage over seats of black and gold bamboo. Newland Archer, as became a young man of his position, strolled in somewhat late. He had left his overcoat with the silk stockinged footman. In parentheses, the stockings were one of Beaufort's few fatuities. Had dealt a while in the library, hung with Spanish leather and furnished with ball and malachite, where a few men were chatting and putting on their dancing gloves, and had finally joined the line of guests whom Mr. Mrs. Beaufort was receiving on the threshold of the crimson driving room. Archer was distinctly nervous. He hadn't gone back to his club after the opera, in parentheses, as the young bloods usually did. But the night being fine, had walked for some distance up Fifth Avenue before turning back in the direction of Beaufort's house. He was definitely afraid that the Mingots might be going too far, that, in fact, they might have Granny Mingots' orders to bring the Countess Alaska to the ball. From the tone of the club box he had perceived how grave a mistake that would be, and, though he was more than ever determined to see the thing through, he felt less chivalrously eager to champion his betrothed's cousin than before their brief talk at the opera. 
Wandering on the Button Door, Drawing Room, in parentheses, where Beaufort had had the audacity to hang Law Victorious. The much discussed Nod of Bugaro. Archer found Mrs. Welland and her daughter standing near the ballroom door. Couples were already gliding over the floor beyond. The light of the wax candles fell on revolving two lace skirts, on girdish hats worthed with modest blossoms, on the dishing aigrettes and ornaments of the young married woman's coiffures, and on the glitter of highly glazed shirt fronts and fresh glazed gloves. Miss Welland, evidently about to join the dancers, hung on the threshold, her lilies of the valley in her hand. In parentheses, she carried no other bouquet. Her face a little pale, her eyes burning with a candid excitement. A group of young men and girls were gathered about her, and there was much hand clasping, laughing, and pleasantry, on which Miss Welland, standing slightly apart, shut the beam of a qualified approval. It was evident that Miss Valant was in the act of announcing her engagement, while her mother affected the air of the parental reluctance considered suitable to the occasion. End of the chapter, page 16.